Okay, guys. Uh, so let me go back to my uh, original notes. Okay, guys, so we already covered um, a lot in, in the last few weeks, I would say. And now it's time to just go ahead and start to talk about something new today, which is I promise it will be very beneficial. Okay, the way that I look at uh, why it's beneficial, because basically it's where, if you started to work in industry, uh, you know, organization or a corporate environment, you will see this equipment, okay? So if you got um, uh, hired by Aramco, for example, or got, got hired by Sabic, or got hired by maybe Petro Rabig, or you got hired by maybe an, um, an uh, telecom uh, institution like, uh, you know, STC or Mobile, okay? You will see a lot of equipment rather than just our computer. So they do have some equipment that's running in Aramco or Sabic or STC or you know Mobile, rather than just computers. Okay, they do have industrial computers. They do have different operating system. They do have different protocols. You know, uh, different uh, uh, communication links. Uh, can get, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay, so they do have different operating system, different uh, different uh, controls, uh, different uh, I would say different uh, different uh, uh, different uh, hardware, and uh, also in the last few years, this equipment was really really under attacks, and the way why this equipment was under attacks because originally when we used to have uh, factories. And we used to have industrial organization uh, 20 or 40 years ago. It was completely isolated from the internet and it was completely isolated from our uh, networks. But now what happened is we started to really relay that we connect our industrial controls. And I'll explain what is industrial control system in just one second. But I'm just saying that our factory before, you know, to, you go to work in a factory you find the factory completely isolated. Maybe it's a rig in the middle of the sea. They have no communication links with the main uh, mother company and um, maybe in, in Jeddah or Riyadh. So they didn't have any communication links. You have a rig in the middle of the sea or a rig in the middle of the desert and it runs its own equipment. Like they have some sensors, they have some uh, you know, motors, they have some pipes, but they are all connected within a small range of geographical area, and it was not connected whether to a LAN or a WAN at that time. So what happened is in the last 20, 30 years, most of this equipment get exposed to the internet because what happened is the management wanted to know what is happening in our factory there? What is happening in our remote rig? What is happening when it comes to a remote side for a mobile uh, station, okay? I wanted really to watch and monitor because this is giving me insight and it will allow me to take businesses decision quickly. So for example, if I have an oil rig that produced 300,000, okay? I wanted to know exactly how many thousands of barrel of petrol this rig has produced today, because this is will allow me as a mention industry of uh, maybe the Ministry of Finance to tell, me, to tell the public that we produced here today around 1 million barrel. What, how did we get this number? We got this number according to the number, the real number, we got from this rig today. So at this instant uh, time, I can tell how many exactly, but before, you know, I used to call someone, but now I have a dashboard in my, in my, in my office as an, a CEO or a CFO, and I can see what's happening in all these rigs. And I even, I would encourage you guys uh, to look at um, Aramco back in 2014, 2015, they have very nice video about how they can really monitor every single pipes within the whole kingdoms just from an operation center. So you will have an operation center uh, in Riyadh and they are sitting in front of like a screen which is maybe 150 inch or 200 inch and they monitoring the whole pipeline from the rig when you are extracting uh, oil and gas all the way till the exporting point. 
and everything that is really monitored. So if something happened, they can instantly troubleshoot it or they can instantly say what is happening in this. So this is what is what is uh, we we're gonna discuss today. So I hope this is will be like really interesting thing. Okay, so what is, is operational technology? Let's just jump here and to try to find out Gartner uh, definitions for what is operational technology is all about. So if you guys allow me to really uh, use this in a bigger format, okay, make sure that guys, if you don't understand anything to stop me and saying what is happening right now. Okay, so we have here operational technology, the definition is saying it's a bunch of hardware and software that detect or cause a change through the direct monitoring or control of physical devices, processes and events in the enterprise. So again, so if you wanted to really understand what he's saying here, he's saying basically I have computers because he said it's a bunch of hardware and software that detect or change means that I can monitor in using these computers, okay? Or it change physical environment um, or physical environment, okay? Is what, what we mean by this? So I have supercomputer here, and I will ex exactly tell you what is this supercomputer is gonna do. Okay, this computer is connected to something, okay? And because it's connecting to this thing, and I will explain what is this thing of it, I can read from this device, and I can really control this device to do something about it. Okay, so basically we have computer that, con that control the physical environment. I will give you a simple example to clarify what I'm saying about this thing. And sometimes when you go in the streets, you find that it's showing you the temperature in the street 38 or 40, okay? How we manage to get this 38 degrees? So what happened is I have something called sensor. And sensor is an analog device that can really measure the temperature and because I am connecting the sensors, I will call this sensor, I will give it a sensor. Okay, I'm connecting the sensor, which is an analog device to a computer or to a screen, which is a digital screen. It can sense the temperature and right away, it will really transfer this analog uh, sensor uh, reading to digital thing, one and zero, and it shows me the right, uh, the right, uh, the right, uh, the right uh, temperature. So this is basically a computer that's connected to a device and it can read the output of this device and display it to me. Okay, guys? Okay, uh, type of sensors, thermal head, exactly. So there's so many type of sensors uh, and I will show you uh, today in our lecture, uh, so many nice sensors uh, and we can play with it. Okay, let's say then, I, this is only uh, a device, which is, we call it sensor, it can sense the physical environment and can transfer this through a computer to digital degree so I can uh, I, I can show the degree. Okay, in another cases, guys, let's look at the traffic lights we have right now in our cities. Our traffic lights is really complicated system right now. I don't think that it's really easy, like three uh, different uh, lights turning on or off. No, they are connected to a supercomputer somewhere in a command center let's say the police command center, and through this link, they can control the signals to open and sense what's happening in the traffic and also some cameras here to read what's happening in this traffic light. So what I'm, what's happening here? First, I can really read uh, if this signal is specifically is read right now, okay? And I will activate the camera to see if there is any violation. And not only this, let's say that I have a guest or someone special that's coming to the country and they wanted to control this traffic signal from the command and uh, co command and control center. So using this computer, I can really turn this red to only green right now, okay? Just to let this guy to go without st being stopped in the red signal. And you, I'm sure that you have seen movies that the hacker was really able to just, you know, uh, you know hack the system and started to control you know, the traffic signal left and right. Have you guys seen any one of these movies? You didn't see Die Hard 4 or, um, I don't know, is uh, oh, so yes, many. I see it. <laughs> yeah, okay. So they, so this basically what it is saying, it's saying the same thing we I was explaining here. This is what operation technology is all about. I have a computer, a specific computers, talks a specific uh, protocols because we said that in order to communicate from 
two devices, we need a certain protocols that allow us to communicate like TCP IP in the, in the normal, in the normal uh, times like we have. Okay, and we have also devices, which is physical devices. And through this computer, guys, I can really control these devices. And that is what is OT is all about. Okay, OT is a bunch of computers. And, you know, I find a very nice uh, explanation to it online once. It's saying that we have cyber control physical. This is the easiest way that I can put it. Cyber means IT system are controlling physical devices. Okay. And I will give you a very good example in, in just a few seconds about it. Okay. Uh, so any 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 questions about this, guys? Okay. If you guys uh, visited one of the cars um, uh, cars automotive uh, uh, factories or, or uh, companies before, if you go inside the, what they call it uh, the manufacturer floor when or operational floor when they started to manufacture the car, what you will find in this uh, manufacturer floor or the operational floor, you will find a lot of uh, a lot of robotic arms, okay, left and right. And you have something here in the middle, it's called the belt. Okay, the belt is where the, they put like the shape of the car without any equipment. And you will have a robotic arms, okay, from the left and right, the adding components to this uh, frame or the car frame. And some of these are adding tires, some of these are adding like the motor, some of these are adding the you know, radiators and so on until by end of this build, you will find the car is almost ready. It needs like a small thing is until that we can take it out of the build and start it to ship it out. Have you guys seen this? Uh, I've seen this seen... in, uh, in YouTube. Yeah, in YouTube, exactly. Okay, so in YouTube. So in YouTube, you can see, uh, say that's uh, Tesla. If you guys have time, go and, and check it out. Uh, Tesla and manufacture floors. It's crazy, okay? You will see all robotic arms are build, building the cars, okay? So how these robotic arms are programmed, okay? What kind of software is running on this, uh, in this robotic arms and how it gonna do their job? So we can see it's a computer end of the day. The, uh, the, uh, the um, robotic arm is a computer that is really programmed and it's if, uh, uh, like the end result, it can control the build here and to control the car manufacturing. So we have computers that connect to uh, the build and they started to build the car step by step. And that's what actually operational technology. We have hardware software, which is mean supercomputer that can detect that the car moved from this point to this point. So I detect this car is now is under my control and the change. Well, how I'm gonna change, I will add another you know, piece of hardware to the car. And when it's moved to another area, the another sensors will feel the car has moved and that start to add pieces to the car until the end. So now everyone, I hope that this is clarify what is this uh, OT is all about. Okay, guys? Okay. So yeah. far so good? Okay, clear. Where we can find OT? Because you know, I, you told you told me you know, on the traffic lights we find OT, in the streets we find OT. Okay, you said this is also in a manufacturing we find IT. Uh, okay, we, we you guys you guys said that there is we in a manufacturing uh, factories like cars or petrochemicals we can find OT. So where what where exactly? Uh, maybe in find? the future. Um... We find it in the operation uh, room at uh, the hospital. We'll find it even in our homes. Yeah. It's right now mm -hmm. we have something called uh, building, building management system. And the building mm -hmm. management system is OT. Because you know what? It can feel, it can, it can detect the smoking in your building. Yes, it can take yes. an action to call the police. Uh, some of the, you know, the uh, new home, cities yes, or new homes is a smart homes. It's all mm -hmm. about computers are monitoring your uh, air condition, uh, your uh, your fire detection systems, uh, your maybe humidity within the building, everything, the gas leaks, everything. And as soon as there is something happening, it can do a change. So it detect and it change. So uh, you will see it everywhere. Now the new devices that comes in the market, like the new fridge uh, washing machine and all the stuff, it's becoming an OT also, because you can connect it to the internet Okay, and you can really control uh, the, the the device by your phone. 
So for example, I have a friend of mine here, just leave beside me, my, my house right away. Okay, uh, he has an OT uh, door lock, which is the OT door lock is connected to the internet and he can connect to the application within, using his mobile. And uh, once someone is in the door knob, he's can, like knocking the door, he can see, he can open the camera and see who is standing there. If it's one of the, his kids, he can turn the lock on and let his kids get in. If he doesn't know who is this, so he will go out. So this is kind of thing is that we will see OT. So OT really is becoming like the trend now, especially with something called, like Naif said, the IoT, which is Internet of Things. Internet of Things is part of the big umbrella that's called operational technology. And again, what it is operational technology? It's very simple. Operational technology, I have a computer or a mobile device that control physical environment, whether it's a camera, whether it's a, a robotic arm, whether it's a traffic signals and so on and so forth. So where is where I can find the OT? This is where I can find OT. So guys, in agriculture and food, I will ex I give you an example for this. Maybe you will never uh, like expect that it exists, but I will give you an example for this. Okay, banking and financial service, they have also OT systems, okay? Chemicals or petrochemicals, when you are having a facility or something like a Betro Rabir uh, facility or Aramco, they do a lot of things that's automated, okay? Commercial facilities, communication links, dams, that thing that allow water to get in and out. So how we open the dam and how we control the dam, it's also an, a computer that you are sitting at, uh, on it as an operator and you are controlling the physical environment here. I will give you an also a tax that's happened in dams before. Okay, defense industries, all these uh, new drones and everything that they're using right now is sort of IoT that's connected to the internet and someone is using some sensors uh, away from these drones are controlling it. Emergency service, energy, like the power grid, how the power grid is really managing to, to, to deliver uh, you know, electricity from the main power station all the way to your home and how we getting the bills right now. This is all gonna be OT. So now, uh, like if you look at Saudi Arabia, for example, and for, for me, it's in Egypt, in Europe, it's happening right now. You have something called the smart meter and the smart meter basically it's it's really uh, it's really um, you know checking uh, the consumptions and then it allows a company okay because they are connected to the internet it can see your consumption and can generate the bills automated so if you are sitting at home you are not waiting for someone to come to your home and to check the meter and then go back to the uh, the company put these numbers and then they will start to generate uh, the, the bills for you. What's happening right now, it's all automated. So the smart meter is connected to the internet, connected in a specific board to the company, the company checking how much consumption you have and then generate the bills and then you get the bills automate, uh, automatically. And as you can see, the whole idea here is automation. I wanted to automate things because when I automate things, I really can do things in a much better, uh, faster uh, way. So this is also the energy, energy sector is huge when it comes to OT. Governments, they are using OT, like government facility, health cares and public uh, health. A lot of hospitals right now, they do have an IOT um, devices, okay? Uh, one of the things that I watched once that someone in Japan who was like a surgeon, uh, he was doing uh, another operation for someone who is in in US using a robotic arm. So the, this guy who's sitting in Japan was controlling a robotic arm in the US and he was doing the operation. So this is also sort of OT systems. So it's also very common to see it in also in healthcare. Another or also organization that you will find uh, OT inside is for sure information technology, nuclear reactors. And this is also very dangerous area because right if we have a computer who control this very, uh, very uh, critical, uh, critical facilities, then if someone hacks this computer, then you will have the whole nuclear reactor under the attacker's discretion, so they can do whatever they want. Our transportation system, 
which is especially the autonomous cars, the car that can drive itself. Okay, this is also part of the OT water and water waste. This is how the water gets to our house and the water waste, waste is sewage that goes out, also controlled by OT. And I will show you some attacks that happen in the water and water waste uh, systems and critical manufacturing. Like if you are manufacturing cars, manufacturing petrochemicals, manufacturing maybe, uh, you know, homes, uh, furniture, this is, we all call it critical manufacturing. Okay. If you go on the study OT outside, especially um, uh, in the US, they don't call it operational technology, they call it critical infrastructure. Why is it called critical infrastructure? Because it's critical for the nation. It's not critical only for individual, because uh, usually who is running the nuclear facility? Who is running the transportation system? Usually in the big, big countries, it's not only private uh, sectors, it's the government itself. So that's why they called it critical infrastructure. And one of the stories that I wanted to share with you, because how we get NIST framework that I'm always showing you every, every single day in the program. Well, how did we get NIST framework, which is called NIST SCF, okay? Which is critical infrastructure framework. You know, critical infrastructure framework born back in around 2013, Okay, when Obama was a president of the US and basically they found a lot of attacks, a lot of cyber attacks on the water system and the nuclear facility and the transportation system and the electricity systems, okay, and the critical infrastructure. So they said, okay, we need a framework to really protect our critical infrastructure. And they add to the critical infrastructure, information technology and banking. So they expanded their critical infrastructure because they said, okay, if our banking system is down, means the entire life in the US will be impacted. So we will consider financial also as critical infrastructure. So they, they bring people from outside the industry, like from outside the government, like specialists, specialist people from in cybersecurity, and they got people from the government itself and they sit together and they came up with SNES the same diagram that I, show, I showed you that contains five cores and subcategories that we always discuss, identification, protection, detection, you know, uh, detection, responding and recovery. So this is NIST, okay? And it's born in 2013, 2014. And basically the whole aim of NIST is to protect the US critical infrastructure. So this is also the story I wanted to, to tell you. And that's why when I always explain to you something in the morning, I always try to really relate it to NIST because eventually you can end up maybe working in a government and your whole soul is to protect their assets. So you need to understand this assets could be for you, it's just an, a file or a server, but it's really part of the critical infrastructure. So what happened to this server, okay, if it's went down? Is, is it gonna affect my uh, impacted my transportation system? Is it gonna impact my water and uh, wastewater uh, system or treatment system? Okay, is it gonna make my like really critical uh, manufacture uh, petrochemical facility is down? How this is gonna impact me? You can see the impact, maybe it's a small impact in you as a company because you financially will not be able to work, but maybe the impact is exceeding this to a far concern, which is gonna impact the entire economy and impact the entire uh, country, okay? Because if you have an attack in a nuclear facility, they took one server and compromised it, or maybe they did something wrong in the nuclear facility. This is not gonna be also impact on one computer. This is maybe can lead to a human loss. And I will show you one attack that can actually cause the human loss because of the attacks in cybersecurity. So now we are talking about attacks that can really, really not only damage computer and cause uh, impact when it comes to, um, uh, to money, or reputation, we are talking about attacks that can really lead to a really catastrophic events. I will just give you an example for what something happened recently, you can find it in the news. Okay, so in Iran, they have um, a system that connected all the gas stations together. Okay, so the gas station all in Iran connected to one single super system that give people discount, especially the this taxi drivers, okay, uh, when they are in the morning, fueling their car before they go. 
Okay, so what happened is the taxi driver will add his card, okay? And you know, uh, once he add this card, he will get a special discount so he can add fuel and then go to start his day. So what happened is they went one day. So this is the supercomputer duper that is really controlling the whole thing. Okay, it was controlling this, but someone hacked it. Okay, and they started to really make the system malfunction. It's not working anymore. So if you add your card here to maybe fuel your car, it will not work and it still will charge you for the full price. So what happened is the taxi driver are standing here. Okay, they're not moving because they're waiting for the discounting uh, gas uh, or oil. Uh, uh, and the rest of the car outside, they wanted also to go to the gas station. They cannot go because the truck taxi driver is here. They're not moving. They wanted the uh, fuel for the cheaper price. And end of the day, these guys was like really didn't go to work because they're standing in the queues here. And end of day, it, it lead to a riots. People were saying, why, what's happening? Why are we not getting uh, the, you know, the, the, the oil uh, prices on the same range and all this stuff. And apparently it was a cyber attack. And why it's showing them the cyber attacks? Because even this machine that was supposed to see, to show them, uh, to scan the card, it was showing them like a funny message about Khomeini. So this is kind of attacks that is not only impacting a one person or a one company or maybe an organization, it's impacting the entire uh, whole city or entire whole country. And as I mentioned, it, it can lead to really uh, catastrophic events. Imagine if these people like really went to riots and just started to break things around. What is it? Well, this is only by a cyber attack. This is, I'm telling you, a small cyber attacks that can happen in the critical infrastructure or how it can really impact us. So imagine if it's like a super thing that impacted uh, a nuclear facility, what will happen? Okay, guys, so far so good. Any questions? So far so good, thank you. Okay, so today, uh, I just, in order to understand cyber uh, OT, okay, I wanted just to start the day with just giving an example how this is all started. So I, I really went through, okay, how it's really, really started because I wanted to understand how automation started, how we end up having a computer controls our really important assets, which is very important because, you know, if you know the story from the beginning, it's easy for you now to protect it because you cannot really protect, which is you cannot really understand. If you don't understand how things works, okay, I can assure you, you will go and work in a place. And if you never bothered how this place is working, okay, you will be completely blind. So I wanted to really give you an idea how things started, okay, and then what kind of components we have in our system and who is managing these components. So in order to really find a solution to protect it. So let's go and we take an, a very, uh, the, one of the oldest um, uh, OT uh, system that exists in the world is the agriculture and water facilities. Okay, when, this is one of the oldest, like maybe 150 years ago, they started this um, OT system. Okay, so let's say that we have uh, a nice uh, area here that we are gonna, uh, you know, um, planted with some uh, some trees or whatever, okay? And I have a river here, okay? But the problem with the river here is the river, sometimes the water level is going up. So it's gonna flow the water to the plants. It can really lead to bad uh, impact. And sometimes it's very low. I cannot get any water, okay, from here to uh, watering my plants, right? So what happened is I started to build the tank and I said, you know what? I will add water here. So, and I use this water tank to, you know, to watering my plants, okay? So this is, um, uh, so in, in order to do this, I need a tank, I need my agricultural land, and I need a water source, which is a river or whatever the source that you can get, okay? Okay, so in order to fill the tank, guys, okay, I need a human here, which is what he gonna do. He will, he gonna use a, a pump. You know, water pump is basically, this is, uh, I'm sure that you have it even in your building in Saudi Arabia, which is basically, if you have the water in a, in a very low, you know, uh, level, it can bump the water up all the way to the top here, and then it cuts the water to fill the tank. Okay, so we know what is a water bump now. It's just uh, a motor that it can help you to take the water from a low level, which is maybe the level of the ground or be below the ground, and it can push it all the way up. So even our buildings, 
in Saudi Arabia or in Egypt or even in Europe, they have this water bump because if you have like a building of 10 floors, the water you know level to goes to the 10th floors is very low. Okay. Um, and then we have also here like a small, um, I would say, uh, like a small uh, uh, valve that when I open it, okay, the water will start to you know to flow to my land. Okay, so we're very easy. So I need this guy every day to come in the morning, okay, to fill this water tank, okay, and I need him to come also afternoon that the day the, the time that we are watering our plant to open this valve to let this water uh, start to, to get the, the water supply. Okay, guys, so far, so good? Yes, so far, so good. Okay, yeah. so let's say that we wanted this guy over here to relax, to take a vacation, okay? We wanted to do automation for this process. How can we do an automation in this process? And that's why we move into this, uh, to this, to this diagram. So this diagram, guys, if you can see, okay, I wanted this guys, I wanted to automate the process, so what I did is I tell I tell these guys, you know what, you go get some rest. I wanted to do this in an automated way. Why? Because if I have only one piece of land over here, okay, and I have to do this, so I have to hire someone every day to do this over and over and over. If I have 10 pieces, I have to hire 10 people. If I have 100 pieces, I have to, hundred, to have 1,000 people to do this operation. And you know, you have to keep basing. So they said, okay, how to automate? So Automate means I don't want any human intervention. I wanted to open this and close this automatically. So they said, okay, what we need to do is we need to have over here a motor and I explain what is a motor. I need to have a valve here and a valve here. So this is what we need. And I need to have a tank over here, okay? And they don't need any human intervention. So I wanted this pump to open in a regular basis, okay? And to add water here. And I want to this valve to open in a regular basis, okay, and really watering my plant and to stop in a regular basis. Also, I wanted also some logic in this uh, scenario, which is the logic is, if I fill the tank, I need to really stop bumping more water and the closest tank, because if I, my tank is, does have a maximum limit here. So if I keep pushing, bumping more water, when I reach the, the max, what will happen is overflow. This is uh, what is overflow is all about. So overflow means things will be uh, not handled in a proper way and it will go chaotic. And that's why if we reach to this limit, I wanted this, uh, this pump to stop and I wanted this valve to be closed, okay? And I will not allow the pump or the valve to be involved again, as long as the water level above 90%. Okay, guys, so this is uh, just, um, uh, this is just, just uh, says that we am, mashallah, saying we add sensors, bravo, says that we am. We need to add like a sensors here to sense exactly how much is the water level over here. And then we need also to read the sensor output, okay? And accordingly, we need uh, this pump to listen to what is the sensor are saying and take an, a, a decision, uh, you know, according. So everyone understand what we, we're gonna do? We're gonna yes. add a sensor that is gonna tell us what is the water level. And accordingly, it's either, if the water level is too low, okay, it's reached to this area, that's mean I really need the bump to be working. So the sensor will tell a computer or supercomputer that the water level is very low and we need to take an action about it. So the, the computer will take an action to turn on the bump and to open this valve and the start the water are coming in. So this is basically what's happened. So I wanted to automate to this process. How can I automate this process? And this is, and we add uh, timers. Very good, the says Haya, MashaAllah Haya also thinking about, okay, I do I need to do this in a, in a regular basis? So I need a timer. And that is exactly what is, I was going to discuss with you guys, that the timer will be very important because I wanted to check the water level, especially in the morning, when there's maybe the, the, the water level in the, in, the, in, the, in the river here is high. So I wanted to do this on, on a regular basis, on a time basis. And I want to water in my plants at the specific times every day. So I will add a timer here to do this all with the timing. So this is all good. So how can we do this? Okay. So this is our objective is less manual work, more automated work and everything without human intervention. Okay. So when we wanted to do this in the early beginning, we will divide this components 
two components that we can control and component we have no control about it. Okay, so we divided we divide this component to active components and to passive control, uh, components. The active com uh, components something I can change. For example, the bump I can change the status for the bump. I can be turn it on or turn it off. The valve also something I can change. It's something I can open or close, right? But the tank can I change the tank? Okay, the tank is gonna be a solid. Uh, you know, uh, uh, solid uh, metal thing or solid uh, building that is, I'm gonna build once, but can I change uh, like uh, how deep is this, uh, how deep, how many liters I can put in this tank? No, I cannot. Okay, why? Because the tank is just built one time and I cannot. Okay, the pipes also guys, I cannot change anything because you, uh, you cannot really make it bigger pipes or smaller pipes. It's you buy the pipes and you have no control over it. So I will not make it a, a bigger or smaller. It's just the end of day a buy. So thing is that I can control or change the status. I call it the active component and change is that I cannot really change anything about it. It's also passive, it, um, you know, um, passive component. So far, so good. Any, I'm just telling you the story from the beginning, but I will show you how we end up with a, a system that's OT system. Okay, guys. So. Uh, in a large scale, as, as you guys mentioned, we need to add time uh, 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 timers. And uh, as uh, one of you guys, uh, Haya was saying that we need them to add a timer. Okay, so, so the timer we can allow us in a certain timing in the day to really watering our plants. And this is how it is, okay? You cannot just open this valve and let it just flow water all day long because this is can actually cause like this, uh, uh, this agriculture land to also um, to uh, to be flooded with water, and this is not also good. So I don't want this habit. So I will add um, a timer later on. Okay. And then once we have we we already discovered the active component, the valve. Okay, the motor. Okay, and the valve too. And I mentioned there is a sensor here. I will take this all components. Okay, the valve, and I will connect it to a computer. And I will tell you. Uh, how we connect it to our computers. We can again connect it with computers with wires. Wires means there is a wire coming from here, or I will not call it a computer now. Let's say we call it a brain. Why I'm calling it a brain? Because this brain is, is really gonna do something about what he is gonna sense. So if the, if the brain find out the water level is low, it will open the bump and it will turn on the valve. If it's the water level is high, it will take a decision. So I'm replacing the human brain with an automated uh, brain, which is a computer brain. And I'm gonna connect every single thing using wires to my computers, input and output wires. What does we mean by input and output wires here? So I will give you an example. If I wanted to read something, okay, I will call it reading wire, and I will give it the blue connection. If I wanted to control, okay, I will give it uh, the blue line and means I will want it to change something. So here guys, if you guys can see, okay, I wanted to read the water level here. So I connect it to a blue, okay. I wanted to check the status of this motor or this pump is up and, or up and running or it's, in, it's closed. So I will connect it using this blue line. So I will have input and output lines, okay. If I wanted to turn the uh, motor on and off, I will connect it with a green line. If I wanted to, con uh, to turn the valve on and off, I will connect it with uh, a green line. If I wanted to con also to do uh, change the status of this valve, I will connect it with a green line, which is representing I'm changing the status of this device. Okay, and I will tell you how to change the status of the device, but just I'm telling you what is the blue line means and what is the green lines means. So if I'm reading, Monitoring, okay, it's gonna be blue. If I'm gonna change the status, it's gonna be green. And remember, what is OT system is all about? It's hardware and soft software that can monitor or change physical environment. This is what's the definition. So I'm doing exactly what the definition is, is really is all about. Okay, guys, so far so good. Okay, yes, so far, so far, so Okay, good. so if you uh, find anything which is uh, really doesn't make sense, just let me know. So I just wanted to explain. Okay, and then I will list all the components I have here. 
okay and i will explain also the type of data i'm getting okay so if the data is i'm getting is like a, a binary data it's like an on and off so one or zero electric electricity or no electricity okay so it's gonna be um, open or close and this is gonna be binary if i'm gonna read the water level okay in this case which is wl1 okay the water levels okay i'm gonna read it by liters okay so i said like there is 100 liters 1000 liters you know uh, 10000 liters okay so this is this is going to be a number okay so this is not going to be like we call this analog okay signal it's not going to be like a digital signal which is one and zero so all what i'm going to say i'm going to say here in this diagram that i have some components here which is going to be just open or close this is going to be really a uh, binary thing okay it doesn't have no more values than open and close some components here the sensor specifically okay is going to give me the level of water which is going to be maybe uh, 50 liters there is 100 liters there's 1000 liters okay so this is a number i need to convert it later on so the computer can deal with it as as something the computer can deal with it why because our computers doesn't understand anything except on and off or one and zeros okay so i'm going to deal later on with the weight water level analog signals we call it analog signal okay i know that if you never seen this analog uh, signals uh, but the analog signals is something like this okay so it takes different you know values according to the time that i'm looking at the signal at so this is analog signal so maybe at one certain time the the water level it will say 20 meters okay uh, sometimes it's saying 50 meters sometimes it's 30 meters so it takes different values while exactly the sign exactly. Bravo and knife. Well, uh, this brain and knife is a BLC. I'm coming to what is BLC, but just 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 give me one second because I wanted to let, to let them to take the step by step. I know because you are reading now security plus, so you know what is BLC. Okay, and digital signals, it, guys. Uh, use the zero and one. Yeah, digital signals is one and zeros. It looks like this. Okay, so either the signal is one or zeros. Okay, there is no more, uh, you know, in between one or zeros or zero. Sometimes minus one is also represented in one. It depends about the, if you are looking at the, you know, the, how, how the voltage is being measured. I'm not gonna go there, but I just wanted to tell you there's a difference between them and we will gonna address the difference between them in just a few seconds. Okay. Mr. Yeah. I hate to interrupt, but the slides that you sent on the Discord is is not like this one. So if no you can find a time to share the right ones. No, no, sure, I will share the right ones. I'm really sorry. Uh, I thought I thought I shared the right ones. Uh, it's it's me. Sometimes I just send so many things on Discord. Okay. Just let me show you. Um, okay, so the lectures, oh, scatter generation. Okay, so I know what I did wrong. I have already sent the next lecture for today. I will send you guys this one. Uh, SCADA. Yes, this is the one. Let me check how many. Yes. This is SCADA. This is the one. Okay, let me check. Thank you. Uh, but thank you for telling me. It's good that you are focused, but let me make sure that this is SCADA. No, it's not even the one that I sent is not there. Sorry, I have to save it in my downloads, okay? In order to be able uh, to share it. Okay, sorry about this guys, but it's really important if you wanted to take a note, it's really important that uh, you will have the same exact thing that I have right now. So I have added both of them. This is the one that we explaining here says, uh, I don't know who was talking. Uh, Lamia. Lamia, okay. I this is yeah, Lamia, uh, the chapter one introduction to SCADA. Okay, but uh, thank you. And, uh, thank you to t for telling, for letting me. Okay, so we, we can see also here guys after, this is where we, we, we used to be. And this is here, okay. The, also my same components, the type of data. And as I, I told you, some of these sensors, I'm just gonna read from them 
and some of them I would like to write. Okay, write mean I want to change the status. So right here, that doesn't mean like our write uh, that we have in, in computers. No, write mean I want to change the status. So if the valve is open, I can close it. If the motor here is closed, I can open it, okay? While here are representing, I'm reading, I'm monitoring a certain uh, sensors and I can read the data. So here, the WL1, I can read the data, so I give it R. So now we can see that we said, first of all, we will have our equipment, okay? We will connect this equipment to a computer. For now, I will call it a computer or a brain, okay? And I will have inputs and outputs, so this brain can read some data, and this brain can take an action, okay, in some cases. Okay, so far, so good? So far, good. Okay, and if you can guys see also here, it's very, it's very easy to say that it's a binary, there is a binary conversation will happen, especially when we look at the things that's open and close. So the conversation here is gonna be binary, while here is gonna be a signal or a scale. So I have, for example, 18,000 liters, that represent 50% out of my tank is full. So one of, one of the things that you understand, you need to understand here, some of the data that's coming from the sensors, okay, or some of the data that's coming from the equipment is one and zeros. So it's easy for the computer to understand because it's either there is electricity in this device or no. Some of them are analog. Analog means I'm reading a data and I need the, the computer to really understand what is it's all about. So I hope this is also clear. Okay, so for the analog signals, I have an issue, which is, is that analog signals is not, we cannot understand it by computers, by the way. Okay, so the computer doesn't really understand analog. Why? Because all our computer is based and built upon binary systems, one and zero. The main component that it's used for the computer for the first generation and second generation is transistors. And transistors is basically on the IC chips, it's all about one and zero. So you don't understand analog. So how can I let the computer understand analog? And here, a very nice conversation, uh, like a conversion, sorry, to how to change analog to digital. So look at what's happening here. It's saying basically, okay, the sensor provides an analog value range from two, 100 to 1,200. What is 200 and what is 2,000, 1,200 guys? Basically, the minimum here, the minimum here that I don't want my water to go blow it is 200 meters. Okay, minimum and max, exactly as says uh, we am. And the maximum over here is 1,200. Okay, how did I get these numbers from? Is when I designed the tank first time, I know this tank is maybe four meters, multiply it by, you know, eight meters or nine meters, this is gonna give me around this uh, certain, I will, uh, I will also, you know, uh, multiply it by the widths over here. So I will know the whole volume for this. So this is, can tell me what is the 200 meters and 1,200 meters from it, according to the dimension of your tank. Okay, guys, do you agree? Okay, so we understand where did it get this one. The logical control need to read the value and perform scale conver a conversion. How the scale conversions, okay. Zero, okay, percent means I have 200 meters. So if I come here and I measure the, the water level here and it's shown 200, I need to say, I need to transfer it to zero. So it will reach to my computer as like there is no water. I need now to take an action and open water because I have no water at all, okay. If it found out it's 1,200, so that the water is full, that means I have full capacity, 100%, okay? So now I I, the computer can understand. The, if I send it, uh, I, I, I already checked the depth of the water and it's around 1,200, the computer will not understand because this is an analog. But I can now say there is a zero, which is represented by 200. And there is a hundred, that is kind of represented by 1,200. Okay, guys, so I'm giving a discrete number for my computers, so the computers can really uh, deal with it. What if I found something in between, okay? Which is basically 700, which is something in between. That represents the 700, that's half-half, means I have 50% here. So now 
I can tell my computer, I have a signal coming from you. It's either going to be zero, which is represent 200, or uh, max, which is 1,200, or 50%. Okay, guys, this is the scale that I will create. Okay, so far, so good. It's just a discrete scales, so it will be easy to communicate this readings to my computer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's move on and see how we can write this. So for example, over here, okay. Uh, I have here my components. I have the type of data. I have the read write means I'm reading a components or writing to comp components using the read write. I'm talking about the what kind of data that I would transfer to my computer or to my brain over here. It's some of cases it's one and zero, so binary or a scale, which is an analog signals. Okay, and the scales I reach to, I can transfer to my computers either one or zero. Okay, what does that mean input output here? Okay. Okay, input that I'm getting data from my sensor. I'm getting data from my uh, from my uh, bump. Is it on or off? So I'm reading. So this is called input. And this is will help me when I wire this computer or this brain to understand which is gonna send me a signal and which one I will use to control this environment. So they give O for the things that they will use for control and they will give I for the things that will reduce. Okay, guys, okay. Now we come to the components here. If I wanted to read data, I will use sensors. If I wanted to change something, to from on to off, I will use something called actuator. And I have already attached it here in the end, down here, over here, this is a sensor. This is a heat sensor. You can use it at home to, to measure the heat at your place, and then you can connect it using this connector, connect, connectors over here to read the data from here. Okay, guys, so this is a sensor. Okay, and the actuator is basically a small motor that can really turn the valve on or off. So this is what we call actuator. So in this diagram, what I have added over here, the thing is that I wanted to change status from on and off to when it's called actuator. Okay, I will give you an example for actuator from our real life so you can understand what is actuator. You guys have cars, right? When you are really clear, uh, near the cars, okay, you started to press one button in your remote control, and this one button, you will find you will hear a click in the car. And you can see there is a latch here in the door is up. Okay, how did latch is up? Because I have an actuator here. This actuator, when he got the signal, it pushed this uh, latch up, and now your door is open. Okay, when you click another button, what will happen? This actuator, because it's a small motor, it will take it down and the latch will go down and your computer will be, uh, sorry, your car will be low. Sorry, the car will be low. So you understand how the doors in the cars opens is by actuators. Okay, so we have an actuator that can turn this latch or this uh, lock here up or down according to the signal it gets. The same thing, I wanted my bump to be turned on. So I will connect it to actuator. When he gets the signal from the brain, he can turn it on. If he gets another signal, he can turn it off, okay, using actuator. And this is one of the, the things that looks like an actuator. And here is a sensor. What is this sensor, guys? This sensor is a sensor that is gonna sense the environment and give me the analog signal, okay? Why I said I have two sensors? Why I said I have a sensor here, okay? And I have a sensor here. I have another sensor here for the bump. Why I have another sensor here for the bump, guys? Because you know this bump is an electrical machine. Okay, I need some output. How many hours this bump is working every day? Okay, how many years I can expect this bump to really work? Okay, uh, what is the status now of the bump? Is it on or off? So I need to read some data from this bump. Okay, I don't want only to change it. I also wanted to read some data because this is gonna help me also in troubleshooting. Right now I can see no water is coming and I wanted to know what is the status of the bump. Is this bump is working? One of these things inside it is not working, it's broke or whatever. So I add another sensor in the end here, which is another sensor to read the status of this bump. 
So we understand why we have two sensors, one for the water and one for the checking the status of the bump. So far, so good, guys? Yeah, so far, so good. Okay, now I have all the components right now. Now I need only to program this brain, okay, to tell the brain if the water level is at zero, okay, now do something. If the water level at 50%, do another thing. If the water, if the water uh, level is above 90%, do something else. So this is why they called it, guys, brain, because I'm gonna program it now because it's gonna control the whole operation. Because I wanted you to remember, the human eye, when we have a human there, the human can see the tank is full, so he will not open the bump, okay? The human goes at certain time and opens the valve to watering the plants, okay? I want to automate this process now by this brain. So I, now I need to program this plane to do this job. Okay, guys, so let's go and to program and to program this, uh, this brain. So I will say, you know what? First of all, before you do anything, okay, you need to really check the water level. If you don't have the water level, don't do anything. Okay, guys? Sorry, I just jumped one, uh, one, one thing. Okay, so, and I will put three F condition. The F condition, if the water level is below 20%, okay, do something. If the water level between 20 and 90%, do another thing, okay? If the water level is above or equal to 90%, do a completely different thing. So now this is F condition, all F condition. You guys know F else condition? I know that some of you guys coming from yes. programming back condition, uh, programming uh, background. So you know what is F condition? F means uh, it check this condition, check this condition, it check the condition. If this is not, do something else. So this is what is F condition is all about. And this is a way that we program uh, our computers because our, our computer doesn't understand how to change direction. So if, in order to change the direction of a sequential program, I need to add an F condition to change the program condition. Okay, so what I'm gonna add here on the water level really below 20%. I wanted you guys to think logically. If the water is really, really going down here, what I wanted really to do at that time? Do I wanted to really water in my plants or my agricultural um, water, my agricultural land? Or do I want at that time that I know that the tank is now almost empty, okay? And I need some more water. Okay, what should I do in this case when the water is really low? Okay, can someone tell me just by logic what we really need to do at that case? Stop the load. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Execute and stop the load. Okay, so so uh, so uh, Nasiba is saying right, Nasiba. Yes. Yes, Nasiba is saying at that time when the water is low, okay, we need to really stop the flow over here. We don't want to really uh, uh, put more agricultural water here because we don't have water. At the time also, I need to fill my tank because my tank is running out of water, mm -hmm. okay? So I will open, as Ustaz Ahaya is saying, we open valve one, we open bump one, okay? And it's important to know there is also a sequential order here. Why? Because if I open the bump and the valve is not open, you know what will happen? These pipes will explode. So I need really the signals coming from my computer here to be in a sequential order. First open the valve, and then secondly, open this uh, bump, okay? If you do it in a, wrong, for, uh, in, a, in, in a wrong sequence, what will happen? You will have an issue here with your pipes because you're basically pushing water up and up, and this is closed, and the valve, this valve number one is closed, this is going to need to really explode this pipes over here. Okay, guys? Okay. So far, so good? Okay, what if, what if I have the water level is above 90%, so the tank is almost full, okay? Almost, halas, I don't have. Do I have to keep this pump is running? Do I have to keep this valve is open? Do I have to close this valve too? So this is all what you need to do as an engineer. They call this BLC engineers or they called it uh, OT engineers, okay? They need to think about the, what they need to be done at that time. At that time, guys, I don't want to add more water, so there is no point actually to keep this running, the, pipe, uh, the, the bump is running, okay? So I will switch off the bump, 
and then I will switch off the valve. Also, the sequence is important because if I if I switch the valve first, okay, without switching off the bomb, I will also run to two problems. Okay, so I need to think about which one is uh, is is happening uh, first, and that's why the uh, the code the programming that you do here with the OT they call it ladder logic ladder logic because you need to really think what is steps coming before what is steps okay so they call it ladder logic I don't know if you studied ladder logic in the university but or no it's like um, it's very easy but it's you need really to look at which step you will do first before the other steps and eventually when I program this brain here or it's just a programming language because it's software Okay, I will add this condition over here, if you guys can see. Okay, when the lead, when the water level here below 20% over here, okay, close valve two, there is no point to do agriculture right now. Okay, open valve one, look what is comes right after V2, valve one open first, and then turn the power switch on the bump on. The same thing here, and when the water uh, uh, above, 90%, okay, turn our switch off. So you turn this first out first, and then you turn or close the valve. So important to look at the sequence. Here when the water in between, like in this level, for, exact, for exactly, this level in between from 20% to 90%, okay, because you remember we did something called conversion. The conversion moved the analog signal to a rate, which is 9, 20%, 90%. So he said, okay, you know, the water level is okay, now I can really start to agriculture my, 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 my land. So I will open valve two here, okay? I will open valve one if I need, okay? And turn power switch on, so I add more water. So this guy is, is giving water and I keep adding more water because the, it will not harm me at that time to add more water. So the water level is, will stay in a good shape. Okay, guys? So we understand what we're gonna do here. We're gonna have a computer. Yes, now uh, 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 like we use the um, uh, logical uh, gate and a computer. Yeah, exactly, it's logical gate. And yeah. I will tell you, I, I will tell you what is we call this computers in one second, okay? okay. So this computers is a really uh, a, a computers with a specific uh, operating system. I will talk about the operating system in a bit, but just right now, I will write an application here, and this application is basically gonna execute, okay, uh, on this systems using these lines, okay? That is all. But this computer is especially computer, that's why I'm calling it a special computer, because it has different input and output modules. If you guys look at these modules here, this I will call it input and output. Our computers, what is the input and output modules? is a keyboard, you know, a mouse, uh, a screen, right? This is uh, input output modules for our computer. This computer, the input output modules for them is basically a connection to the control systems. So they do connection to the computer system. When you execute the program that you wrote here, it would take the execution to the, uh, to, the uh, to, to the to the OT system. Okay, guys, uh, I don't know, maybe in the university you have seen this. Have you guys uh, dealt with Arduino Ardu before? Arduino platform? Let me show you. Arduino? Uh, yeah, I think can... some of you have seen Arduino before. If you guys never seen Arduino, I will show you. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me clear this up. Uh, go here. Okay, I will show you a small uh, Arduino system so you understand what I'm talking about. Exactly, it's like, a, exactly, Raspberry uh, by four, Bravo says Mac, the same thing here. Okay, so this is guys, the symbol, uh, the symbol uh, shape for the, for this computer that we're talking about, the very simple shape, okay? It's not the same thing, but it's very close to this. So it has here, okay? This is small uh, bins over here, okay? This is the input and output uh, signals, okay? So we can send the signal or read sensors from this input and output, 
we have also a board here that we can connect to our computer so we can program. And they do have one chip here, which is the logical chip, which is a processor chip that we can really program to really control the input and output. So this is in a very simple way. This is not the, how the BLC will look like, but if you open inside the BLC, you will find something uh, similar to this. Exactly, we connect the microcontroller, we program uh, with BLC, uh, with uh, ladder logic, as I mentioned, uh, or any other programming language. Some programming language is very close to C Sharp and C++, okay? And you guys, I think some of you have seen this in the university or they ask you to do a project about it in university. So this guy over here, okay, okay, is basically the brain that I was talking about. I have a processor, okay, which is I can execute instructions to this processor. I have some uh, input and output modules, okay, and these input and output modules will allow the processor to execute, to read data from some sensors and to execute controls to some sensors. Okay, so this is in a very simple way. If you guys look at this diagram, for example, it will tell you which bins consider its output and which bins consider it reading and so on and so forth. And it will tell you where is the process, how to control this by connecting it to your laptop. And then, you know, maybe con control it using, um, uh, you know, a network card or the network interface. Okay, so I hope this is explained a lot so far. So now what I did with this brain now is I really, really, made the whole automated thing, made, made whole operation is automated. So these guys over here, guys, okay, can open the sensors, can open the motors, okay, and can really control the whole process, okay? But I just wanted to tell you, okay, how dangerous if someone managed to really attack this computer, okay? Because you don't have a human intervention now, so you don't know, you bought the system, the system is working perfectly, Maybe you as an owner of the land, you will come every week to check if everything is okay. What if someone hacked the systems, okay, and mess up with the programming or mess up with like how uh, the flow of the water or messing, messing up with any measurements here? Okay, what will happen is this whole system will collapse, okay, and you may end up with a disaster with your agriculture uh, in this season, right? So this is, I'm just giving you an example of what can, may happen if we have an issue like this. Okay, so this device over here, guys, um, they called it the controller. In other books, they called it BLC, programmable logic unit, because this thing is all about logic. We wrote the whole thing according to the logic we imagine for flowing the water from one place to one place and, and, uh, and watering our plants, right? So that's why they say programmable. Programmable, yani you can program it, okay? Logic, it's all about logic. I told you, even opening these sensors needs to follow a sequential order when it comes to logic. Programmable logical unit, and this is a unit, we call it like a computers or maybe a, a small super computer. And really, if you look at what it will see, it will say, say saying it's a rigid computer. If you look for definition. And what we mean by rigid computer is computer is tough that can really deal with a harsh environment. Because don't forget where I'm gonna leave this computer. Okay, I'm not gonna create a room for this computer in 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 like in my villa or my or I don't know, uh, my my farmhouse. Okay, no, I'm gonna add this computer somewhere very close to this water bump and very close to the bulb here because I have cable limitation. So sometimes of these uh, computers is really tough computers that can really deal with raining. It can deal with, you know, humidity. It can deal with a high temperature because basically a lot of times we leave the BLCs in the public areas where there is no protection. Okay, we call it rigid computers. Or sometimes I just have this in the middle of the sea in the rig. This is where we are using to really discover, uh, you know, uh, you know, oil and gas under the underneath the sea level. Okay, so we need a, 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 a device here that can really deal with water and also humidity because it's got to be very humid in, in the in the side the water level. So we need really tough computers. That's why they call it rigid computer. But 
the proper name programmable logical unit. Why they call it programmable? Because later on you can say, okay, I need to know, I need to know what say, okay. And instead of switching off my uh, my valve here and my uh, and my bump here around uh, ninety percent, I wanted to change it to eighty five percent. Eighty five percent is the critical level that I'm looking for. So you can go back easily, and you can change the programmable here uh, to a different thing, and you burn it again in the microprocessor, and the microprocessor will accept the new programming that you have just done. Okay, guys, so far so good. Yes. Okay, I just hope that is make all sense. And uh, and also, uh, Haya was mentioning that we need to add also the timing factors inside this. So uh, this cycle is gonna happen every maybe six hours. This cycle is gonna happen every 12 hours. So we really need to look at also the uh, very important thing, which is basically uh, uh, the timing. Okay, because the timing is when we can really say, okay, you know what? every two hours okay i wanted this to work or every maybe six hours according according to one for sure for the what kind of plants you are uh, you know you want to water it over. but this system now can show you that we have automated the whole process and if you can see remember what is ot definition that we said in the early beginning of this lecture we said ot is all about controlling the physical environment and reading data from the physical environment. How we can do this? By software and hardware. And that we can see that we achieve this. So this is in front of you guys, what we called it the OT system. Measure on this, everything you see. Okay, in our building, we have these systems. How we have these systems? We have something called building management systems. And the building management systems is where all your smoke detectors is connected to one center location, which is a computer, which is BLC. And these sensors are really sending the sense of smoke. If it really exceeds certain limits, the, the alarm will start to, you know, uh, uh, it will take an action. An alarm will start to run in your building. And maybe it will start also a voice recognition or sorry, voice, uh, voice uh, speaker and saying, you know, you are under fire uh, maybe you need to leave, evacuate your building right now. Right now, this system is all automated, and this system is all built by sensors and by actuators and by uh, a computer, which is we call BLCs. Um, also, in in factories and in also in um, in, a, in, a, in a in a in especially in a big factories, they relaying in BLC in a really 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 um, uh, I would say. Um, High, uh, um, uh, high levels. So, in, like in, I will give you an example. So, just not just to say, uh, without giving an example. So, for example, I have a, I have now a system that may be making chocolates. Okay, so this is a good thing to remember. So, not all the system are making very serious stuff. It's making chocolates. Okay, guys. So, I wanted really to look at the things that is being done here, how the chocolate is getting the, in the build. And I will look also after the chocolate is being made, how the uh, chocolate is being covered, okay? So this is another process. And also I need to know what after it's being covered, how it's been uh, shipped or how it's been put in a one, in, uh, one box and being shipped, okay? So this is a process of creating or making the chocolate. This is a, uh, a process of covering the uh, chocolate. This is a process of shipment and, you know, a putting in a box the chocolate. So this is a process and this is a process. And what we end up find out in big factories, guys, you will have this whole process is connected to different BLC. So BLC only to look after the creation of the chocolates because I need to add some amount of milk, some amount of uh, cocoa powders, some amount of sugar, uh, and I need to really mix them, okay, and uh, to three, four, five minutes, for example, and then the mixture will go to be, you know, uh, heated or maybe uh, to be uh, frozen. And then this BLC are doing a specific task. While this BLC is making sure, okay, that this chocolate is really uh, covered properly, uh, the cover is fitting the whole chocolate, 
the shock is now in a good condition and it's all covered from bacteria and everything and maybe I will roster the whole thing. So this is BLC also is doing a completely different job than this guy over here. Okay, and this computer that's the add them in the box, you know, the add also uh, some glue to the box and all this stuff, it's doing a completely different than this. Okay, in big factories guys, this BLC all together, I want it to be as a manager of the factory, he's sitting in maybe one higher floor and I can see the whole entire process or maybe I have an engineer who is like, uh, they called it uh, manufacturing engineering or they called them uh, uh, factory engineer. We wanted to see the whole process. So he wanted to, to get all this input and output from all this process. And he would be sitting here, have only one dashboard or a screen. And he say, okay, the production is done, we produce 3000, okay? The boxing is done and we boxed 10,000 books. Okay, you know what? The, I don't know what's happened and we did this and this and this. So this screen can see all things, not only can see what is happening here, okay, but also can control. If I see an issue in one of the builds over here, that's mean I don't really need to produce more uh, chocolate because this chocolate will not be in, involved in the right way. So I need to stop the whole process. So this guy is not only monitoring, but he has the control to stop the whole process. So in manufacturing guys, really the BLC and the connection to the BLC is really huge. Okay, because it's allow you to oversee the whole process of production. If you lose, the production uh, view, you will not be able to really to produce anything. And that's why if you guys look at the attacks that happened last year, if there is an attack was in the US, was it's called the colonial uh, pipeline attacks. It's very well known, it was huge. And that's why you, uh, you saw uh, uh, some of the videos coming in the news, huge people of waiting in the, especially in the Texas area, waiting in the line, waiting for their oil and gas. Okay, basically because this pipeline was controlling all the west of America. So they give um, uh, oil and uh, petrochemicals to the gas station. And because there is a ransom attack controlling the payment system and the manufacturing system, they couldn't really produce anything. They couldn't really also billing anyone. So the system was all under the ransom. So the oil, uh, gas station are not getting uh, oil and gas from the colonial pipeline. And what end up happening is the colonial pipeline uh, company, they bid a ransom of $5 million to the attacker to give them the key to really get back the system. Because what, without the system, they were losing hundreds of millions of dollars every day. And they agreed to pay uh, the, uh, the, the, the ransom eventually. So it's very interesting attack and it shows you it's one attack, one attack in one of these big manufacturers company, it can cripple the whole production and your company will lose million, not even billion of dollars, especially if it's a big uh, company. Okay guys, so far so good. Okay, now, I'm sorry, do you guys want a break or shall we continue? It's okay to continue, I guess. No, no, no. I think I think some of you guys think okay, it's enough. Okay, it's <laughs> it's okay, guys. We can take our right, uh, you know, time. We don't have to rush. Okay, we'll take okay. ten minutes break to get some uh, tea and also get some no. you know rest of talking because if I know this is uh, I'm giving you a headache it. already. Okay, so uh, I will uh, I will uh, try to take ten minutes break. It's good, everyone, and we come back. It's uh, now it's ten thirty. Okay, and we come back around 1040. Okay, so in 1040, we come back, we talk about the rest of the lecture. Okay, thank you.
مستر اسد
Okay, guys, uh, shall I say welcome back? Everyone enjoyed the tea break? Yeah, I don't know. Shad is saying that Alhamdulillah that she enjoyed the tea break. That's good. As well, also good. Lena. Okay, Lena, you're new, new here, right? And uh, this is the first time I see your name. Shaza, who is really like a brand new in this course? Like maybe you joined yesterday or the day before. No one? Everyone is the older crew? Okay, perfect. Okay. So no one joined recently because I saw an email saying that there is two uh, newcomers uh, to the course, maybe like one or two. I'm not sure if they are if they joined or no, but they send them an email, so maybe they never join. I never know. Okay, yeah, but it's good. Name, uh, I think he's new. Uh, who, uh, I'm sorry. Who is this? Uh, Tihal. There is someone uh, named uh, Abdul Aziz. I think he's new. Ah, he's new. Okay, welcome on board, Abdul Aziz. Okay, I don't know if he's here or no, but it's good to have him. Okay. Okay, perfect guys, so we need uh, to keep going on this because this is an important fact that we need to consider. They said that's also when you build the systems, you need to keep in your, cell, your, uh, in your mind some certain uh, safety considerations. And the, as the safety consideration is something that I already mentioned when we are talking about, you know, you need to really consider the order, which you want, which, uh, um, which, uh, equipment or which sensor you will open first and we talked about this okay so we need to consider the order we also we need to make sure that we not bump water to tank while it's full okay because this is gonna lead to an overflow uh, and it can read really later on to do destroy our agricultural lands and oil okay guys external factors also you need to also maybe to have an external uh, sensors to check the water source uh, level. So this is also something you can really can consider it because you wanted really to start to bump water when the water level is high, because this is gonna make you use less electricity to bumping water, right? So there's some other stuff that you really uh, look at and also uh, the plants uh, watering schedule, you need also to look at the timing because it's timing is, uh, as Hadil mentioned before, is very important, especially if you don't want to waste water and especially if you want really to make water management and use every single uh, drop of water. So uh, you guys can understand this is also, this is also consideration, external consideration, but can you, at that time, you can use external sensors to really achieve all the stuff. Okay, but what I really wanted really you guys to look at is what if, what if this BLC stopped to work, okay? Exactly, so the Shaza is saying that's a very good uh, thing that we can also, we need, uh, no, what I, I'm worried about first Shaza, before the attacking area, okay, I'm worried about what if one of these components, or let's say one of these cables is really just being damaged or destroyed, okay? Or what if the BLC, because this is end of day, a computer, right? Or a processor, right? What if this one is a stop? What if one of these uh, activator that I told you is just like a small motor that can really control opening and closing one of these valves stop to work? What will happen? Okay, and I can assure you if you don't really look at these things in a really serious way, this is gonna be happening to you and you will find yourself in a big trouble. For example, you said, okay, let me turn on the valve. Okay, but the valve is not turning and then you right away executed that the bump should be also bumping water. And, but this is because you have one uh, certain components here, which is the actuator here is not working. It can cause also a disaster. Okay, especially if you work in a big manufacturer where you're relying on this system. That's why these system are sold and exist with something called safety instrument systems. Means you have another controller. Okay, you have another controller here and another com actuator connected to this one and another uh, actuator connected here and another uh, actuator connected here. 
and this system we call it SIS. And this system will only be, you know, in the scenes if there is a disaster happening, okay? So if you tried to really, if you see the, and it's also monitoring the water level. What is the, you know, um, consideration here? If the water level is keeping going, going up to the max, and my, my bomb still didn't take an action, that maybe my BNC is not working at that time. So I need an external system to take a decision for safety, just to make sure the things are uh, safe. Okay, so I will not gonna have an overflow. I will not destroy my land. So even my system, my main system is down. I will combine my main system with a system called safety instrument. And the safety instruments only will be in a charge if one of the really bad condition take place without my BLC taking action. And you know, CIS like really can save the day. If you have an issue with one of your actuator here, if you have an issue with the BLC, you have another system who is monitoring the whole process and take an action in case of emergency. And that's what we're saying here. Okay, we had safety consideration all the way implementing the system and the logic. Uh, SSIS objective to avoid failure in the system. This is the main objective. And then let me tell you something, the story that I know from Iran, a nuclear facility, that when the Stucknets, which is one of the most famous malware in the world exists, and I would highly recommend for you guys to go and read about Stuxnet, okay? That when he, it hit the nuclear facility, it really was very close to explode the whole facility. And the only thing that really managed to stop this Stucknet to destroy as a nuclear, a, 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 a nuclear facility is basically the SIS, SIS system. The SIS system, they found very emergency conditioning happening inside the facility, okay? And they said, this is really emergency. We can see the temperature are going really high and this is gonna root, uh, can, can lead to an explosion. So the SIS get in the picture and they start to shut down the whole facility, okay? So SIS can save the day when your main BLC system are not really uh, is uh, for, for stuck nets. The attacker created the malware to basically infect this uh, BLC and make it blind, so it doesn't really see any uh, data or it doesn't really see any temperatures changing. And once the temperature is changing inside the inside the reactors, what will happen? It was going to explode. But the SSIS because it was looking for the emergency, uh, or I would say the uh, the emergency actions. It took the emergency action to say that it's okay. It's too hot. We cannot let the facility work in this condition. So the SIS took the decision to shut down the entire facility. Okay. Only then, when the SIS intervened, people started to look at what's happening. Why the SIS took down the whole facility? And by investigating the BLC, the main BLC, they found the main malware, which is a Stucknet. If you guys really wanted to uh, really um, uh, check about Stucknet malware, okay, it's there is a YouTube video, okay, about Stucknet. It's called Zero Day uh, Attack, okay. It's a video for one hour. It just only talk about how complicated is this malware. This is was the first malware that it was going to lead to uh, a nuclear uh, explosion. So you can read about it, you can watch the video, a very interesting video. You will feel like this, you learned a lot about security just by watching this video. Okay, guys, depending, depending on the type of operation, the loss could be in terms of financial loss, reputation, and even loss of lives. That's why we need the safety, um, safety equipment. Okay, guys, because now we are not talking about, uh, you know, a failure of uh, a nuclear facility that will cause us uh, $20 billion to build it again, or the reputation that we have a facility that is being collapsed. Okay, we are talking about this, you know, when you have a nuclear uh, emissions, okay, it can kill people, animals, and it can really lead to that, that the life on this land of explosion uh, will not be uh, suitable again for maybe 50, 60, or 80 years. You know, until now, Hiroshima's sites 
and uh, maybe to, uh, another uh, another side which is in Russia and Ukraine. It's called uh, Chernobyl. If you guys heard about Chernobyl, also leakage. Okay, until now the area around this uh, facility is not um, is not suitable for life. So again, so this kind of attacks we are really looking at attacks that really can cause uh, human lives uh, in this attacks. Also, if you have a pipeline that carries a lot of oil and gas, okay, and God forbid something happened to this, so someone managed to play with the temperature or someone managed to play with the pressure of oil here. So the certain pressure, center temperature that's need to be here. So if this is gonna be, uh, there's an attack and someone will manage to play with the pressure and then an explosion will happen. Imagine if you have a pipeline that goes around the cities, okay, and the explosion happened, it will definitely kill people. And it's already killed people. So you, uh, I will show you some of real attacks that's happened in the past. It can really cause, uh, or it caused already, already a human life, um, a human life uh, loss. For example, in Ukraine, they used to have, um, an attack in 2015 on 2016, okay, it was attacking their power grid. So the power grid I mentioned is one of the uh, application of OT and the power grid is basically is what it gives you electricity at home, right? Uh, so one of those attacks took down the electricity for around maybe half million people or maybe three or 400,000 people. And it also takes the electricity out of uh, hospitals. Okay, when you take electricity out of hospitals, there's a generator. But generator can really support you until a certain amount of time, and then you will run out also of electricity. So there is some people were in the electricity, sorry, some people were in the intensive care, and they don't find them, like, you know, you know when you are in intensive care, the, that you need, uh, you know, some equipment for breathing, some equipment for, uh, you know, uh, transfer of, of floods, uh, fluids, and blood for you. And if this equipment is really, it doesn't work, it can lead to a death. So some of these hospitals, they reported this because of this attack. So this is how dangerous of, uh, of the of attacks in the critical infrastructure on the attack on BLCs uh, in general. It can really, really uh, le lead to loss of life. And I'm telling you, it's very common now in Saudi Arabia to find they are looking for someone was an OT engineer, OT security engineer. They say that OT, okay, or they call it SCADA engineer, okay, or SCADA security engineer, or they call it ICS because ICS is, uh, is integrated control system, okay, ICS system security engineer. Okay, all of them are very common in Saudi Arabia now. I remember, Lucy, uh, if you guys remember Lucid, I told you this is a company that is really competing with Tesla right now. They, uh, I think one month ago, they were looking for an ICS security engineer for their branch in Jeddah. So what I mean by this, there is a huge market for these, uh, for these jobs, okay? And all what you need to understand is to understand the basics of how this thing works. And then you also need to understand OT, how, how to protect. That's why uh, before I, I taught you this course, like before the cybersecurity, and maybe, uh, few months ago, there is, was only a course, it's called OT security. We have already uh, organized three months of OT security. We're only talking about OT, how to secure the OT environment and infrastructure. So this topics, guys, don't think it's like a, a small topic. This is like a huge topic, okay? And the demand for it is huge, okay? So then say, okay, we talked uh, to a topic today, SCADA, but if you looked online about SCADA security, you'll find books about these topics and you find a whole uh, program that takes weeks and maybe months to just tell you how to protect SCADA because SCADA in the natural of what I have explained to you is different than our only computer system. Okay guys, so this is another thing that I wanted to highlight. So what is, how can we add this SIS system in the next diagram you can see here the, one, the system that's connected with a different color sets over here, okay, and it's really connecting to a specific areas only. This is what we call this SIS. And the whole idea that I will have a main system to run the day-to-day -day process or the operation, and I will have another system only for the avoid 
failure and avoid emergencies. Okay, guys, so we understand what is SSIS so far. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. This is okay. That means you guys understand, or this is. I have to. Okay. Yeah, it's clear. Okay, clear. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention also about this, okay, just to, uh, to keep things clear. Uh, we need to do maintenance. This is a new information for me because I uh, read this. Um, 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 uh, and security plus. Yes. But, yeah, um, but it's, it, they will never the explain this in your security plus, by the way. Uh, yes. I yes. read it. They will tell you, the, oh, we have a SCADA system. We need to protect the SCADA. SCADA is important. Let's tell you how to protect it. Thank you very much. Yeah, I know what is what is written is really in the in the in the security plus about the SCADA doesn't really represent anything about the SCADA. Yes. Okay, okay. perfect. So um, um, they, uh, they, there is also some uh, equipment in this system, guys. That is also uh, it opens the door for attacks, which is basically uh, if I wanted to really review what this system have done in the last three months, because this is gonna be the history of my system, okay? So we usually add a database and this database will be taking the inputs and outputs and the signals from my system and the store it in a database. We call this database the historian database, okay? And the historian database is actually telling you what happened today in your factory. Basically, it's important because sometimes it really give you an indication about your factory, how it's doing in the last few months. So say you're seeing many in February, we have less production and maybe March, we have better production. And maybe uh, by the end of the year, because there is so much celebration, we have really good. So we need to increase the capacity. Just seeing the his history of your production of your servers and what's happening in your environment. Can you give you an indication uh, about a trend or it gives the management the decision to take the decision to say, okay, you know what? I need to buy more material at that time of the year. So it's important to also add this uh, to a database. And this is also opening the door for something important. The management here also need the guy who is sitting in the top management. They wanted to look at this trend. So in order for them to look at this trend, they need to access these servers from their computers all the way, all the way to database. And they need to interact with this database. Okay, and this is open the door for an attack. If someone compromise a machine from the IT environment, okay, it can lead later on for these guys to really compromise the database here. And because there is a connection between the database and the BLCs, because the BLC are sending the data here, then he can really jump to the BLC environment. Okay, so uh, what I'm trying to say this is uh, you need to really do a lot of careful consideration when you implement security around the SCADA systems and the SCADA databases. So this is just another uh, consideration that I would like to highlight. Okay, another thing that I would like to highlight also here before I wanted to you to tell you what opens the door for most of the attacks that we see today. Uh, okay, another thing that's it's opened the attacks is basically uh, ICS system is expensive, okay? I wanted you guys to go and check how much is a BLC. Okay, the BLC that is from a good company that's gonna control a small process, not a big process, is gonna be around five thousand dollars. Okay, if you look for a, a BLC that is gonna control a whole entire factory, it's gonna be maybe a million dollars. Okay, and again, what's happening is when you invest this amount of money in one system, it's not easy for the company maybe two years down the road to say, you know what? Uh, this system is outdated. The operating system that run on this system, okay? Real time operating system is not good, okay? So we need to really replace it. Why? Because you have already as a company invested a lot in this system in the beginning, okay? So you will find an issue, which is you find a factory that is running equipment for the last 20 years or 30 years and it's still running. MashaAllah, okay, no issues, okay? But then the operating system they are using, okay? The vulnerability that exists in these systems, okay? The, the sort of connections they have, 
it's like a completely obsolete. Okay, with a single even scan, scan, I'm not saying that you're attacking them. If you scan this network, okay, because it's a very old system, it can be all down, okay? And it's also hard for you as an engineer to come and say, you know what, all this BLC is outdated, let's, you know, change it. They will not listen to you at that time. And that's why I told you before, there is some sort of controls, which is, I didn't talk about a lot, it's called compensation control. What if I have old system that I cannot really replace, okay? And I need really to protect. And that's why compensation controls, we talked about it when we talked about we have preventive control, predictive control, uh, corrective control, and we have compensation control. Compensation controls in some cases is the only way. So I have a system here that is old, outdated, uh, and still I need it from my factory. I cannot get rid of it. So what can I do? What compensation control? Or maybe I can add VLAN, or maybe I can add a specific firewall in this VLAN, so it's gonna protect the external inbound connections. Okay, the VLAN will isolate the system from talking to other system that can lead this system to compromise the system. So this is what we call compensating control. This is gonna uh, also something that I wanted to highlight before uh, we go ahead and talk about something else. Okay, um, once uh, we talked about safety system, we talked about building management system. This is sort also of OT. That's how you can control the lights inside your building, how you control the smoke detectors, how you control the air conditioning, how you control the fire alarm suspension uh, system, how you control the plumbing uh, and you know uh, water system, waste, uh, waste system, sewage systems. This is all can be now controlled by OT systems. So, and this is also uh, what makes us really relying in OT in a more uh, really safe way. Because now, even someone can hack to your house, okay, and turn your uh, temperature, especially I would say if in Europe, okay, if you someone hacked to their house and turn off their gas and uh, and heating system down, but they will end up they will be freezing in their house, okay. Uh, some of the new uh, fridges, a uh, fridge, and uh, some of the new washing machine are connected to the internet. So what happened? someone really hack your fridge, what he can do? Okay, if he's hacking the fridge, it's a big deal, but because if he hacked the fridge, he's also becoming the same network as you, and because you have a routers and routers is connected to two different, uh, to so many different places. Can he use the, uh, this fridge to be a food hole for hacking another system inside the, inside the house? So this is all stuff that we really need to look at when we talk about, uh, OT. Okay. Uh, something that you will find in the website is called distributed uh, uh, control system, DCS, and the SCADA uh, in our website. And it talks about DSS. What is the DSS is all about? Because this is an important event for the exam. Yes, exactly. I agree with Shah Lamia. It's not even, um, we cannot even, I cannot tell you how many uh, devices. Uh, will be using in the future, but I can tell you for, for now that our cars, you know, our old transportation is going to be autonomous. That means that's basically uh, uh, basically IT, IoT system uh, are running over the internet and they need the internet. So this, this is all cars is going to be connected to the internet because you need to check the traffic, you need to check uh, to get the satellites uh, updates, you need to get all the stuff. So you are 24 7 are connected. And the car is running by itself. So imagine if someone hacked the cars, and, it, and it's not it, it's not like it never happened. There is also two researchers have hacked so many cars, and there's if you looked for automotive hacking, you will find a lot of uh, hacking. Uh, they hack to the entertainment system, and from the entertainment system, they hack back to the car systems, and then they started to stop with the engine, play with the sensors, and they they do crazy stuff. But this is not our story now, just let's focus on in this because this is in our website and I wanted to explain before we go. So, uh, so what is DSS, okay? And why they are saying it's distributed? Okay, I said, I, I told you this in, in, a, in, a, in a previous way, but I just wanted to explain it one more time. So if I have um, a factory, okay? Or I have an oil gas company, okay? they will end up guys with so many PLCs, okay? 
controlling different part of the manufacturing process. So if, if I'm maybe manufacturing cars, the cars will be going through so many uh, stages. The first thing is do add all the accessories, then add the engines, then add the tires, and then make sure the safety equipment in the car and the sensors are working. All this is done by, as I mentioned, okay, let's say that every one of these uh, things are called a process, okay? And every process is controlled by a BLC or uh, a specific computer that's gonna do the whole process. Oh, the car now is ready for the engine. So I will, go to, I will get the engine, I will install the engine, make sure the bullets are ready in the place, make sure that the engine can, has enough oil to run and all this stuff. So this BLC is gonna be responsible for everything, okay? Another BLC was gonna be responsible for the car, maybe suspension system, or maybe another BLC is, is, is about the exhaustions in the car, okay? So we have so many BLCs, okay? As an engineer here, okay, as someone who is working at the cars manufacturing, okay, I wanted to check what's happening for every single car and what is BLC is doing right now. And I can take the decision at one certain time to stop a certain BLC or to run. So when we have so many BLCs, okay, and we have one centralized location to control all this BLC, that is what we call the distributed control system. It's around my facility, okay? So many BLCs, I connect all of them together to one main screen. And from this main screen, I'm controlling the whole factory. And this is what we call it distributed control. And usually this control, as you can have seen it maybe in the movie, this is one room that controls the whole thing. And if you guys remember Jurassic Park movies, they had this room where they are monitoring every single gate in the facility, every single cage, what is uh, where is the camera is, okay? Uh, and they're adding like a small connector to every single dinosaur to control the dinosaur. Have you seen this movies? Yes, I hope it's so. interesting, yeah. yeah. This is exactly a, a very good example for a distributed, but also a SCADA system. And I'll explain what is the difference with distributed. But distributed within is one facility, okay? And this facility, you are controlling every single BLC within your facility using one center control unit that can see everything and can also take a decision if it's necessary. Okay, guys? Yeah. Okay, Operational yeah. control centers. So far, so good, guys? Yes. Okay, perfect. 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 Okay. So this is what? Uh, controller connected to a central controller or a master cell. And we call this DCSC. Okay. There is another uh, thing that I wanted to share with you today. I already shared it with you. In the, in the in the in the in this call, but I wanted to share it with you as well here, uh, which is this one, this lecture. It's called uh, generation uh, ICS SCADA generation. Where is the generation one? Let me check. Oh, this is not the generation one. So let me close this one down. Sorry, guys. Just give me one second. Uh, and the security one is not this one. So I have uh, this one, not this one. So any rating systems. Seems like I have really. Uh, I have really messed up with this one somewhere. I'm sure that's securing wireless networks. No, that's not the sound. Okay. And this is securing wireless networks as well. Just give me one second, guys, because I have I'm sure that I I have it in my downloads. Okay, this one. Sorry. Um so I wanted to tell you what has already opened the door for these attacks, okay? And this is important because you need to really understand how this is all started, how we end up with this really messy situation when we have someone as attacking our water facility, our electricity facility, our nuclear facility. And this is back to the SCADA, so we called it something called the SCADA generation, okay? And the SCADA or ICS or distributed system generation, 
there is four generations of this cadre. In the early beginning, they called it the monolithic. Monolithic systems means a system that's completely isolated. It's a mainframe. It's only connected to a small devices within the factory, and that's it. It's not connected to the internet. It's not connected to a LAN, and it's not also connected to the management or the IT system. It's only there to control the physical devices. So this is the first early generation. If you wanted to see how it looks like, um, I didn't have a picture for it, but it's like a mainframe. You have a mainframe connected in one room, and it's controlling all the devices within the uh, factory using input and output cables. So this is a monolithic uh, one, and monolithic means that it comes to even sometimes you're saying the monolithic religions. Okay. When SCADA system was first developed, this is back in maybe 1900, okay? The concept of computing in general, general uh, centralized on a mainframe system. Network were generally not existed at that time, and each centralized system is standalone. So in order to really do harm to a factory, okay, back in maybe 1950s, 1960s, okay, the only way to really harm them is to go physically and to start to mess up with their, with their um, system itself. Okay, guys, or with BLCs or the distributed BLC, which is the control room. Okay, so this is the early beginning. Okay, so far the first generation. Can we move on? Do you have any questions here? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes, it's good, man. Okay, the second generation. Okay, the second generation of uh, SCADA is the one that started to implement networks. So they started to say, you know what? How we add to our BLCs some network networking but it's not WAN networking, it's only LAN. So within our, within our uh, factory, we maybe will connect one of our BLC, okay, to another BLC using a, WAN, a LAN link. So we started to use LAN. And LAN at that time in 70s and 80s, and 80s was really common to have a communication. LAN. And then he said, okay, if I have a distributed control DCS system that is gonna monitor the whole system, I will, I will connect both BLCs to my DCS using LAN. So this is was the introduction of LAN. But still, my factory is my factory, okay? No one is, uh, is accessing this equipment from outside. So basically, this BLC can communicate using LAN technology, okay, like Ethernet or whatever, okay, using protocols, but they are not exposed to outside, okay? The LAN technology at that time was not really there. And that's why it's saying here, the next generation SCADA system took advantage of development and improvement uh, of local area network LAN technology to distribute the processing across multiple systems, which is basically you have multiple BLC are carrying the job, okay? Multiple station, each with a specific function, were connected to a LAN and shared information with each other in their time and shared the information with the distributed uh, controller here over here, that's the master server. Okay, guys? But at that time also still, there is no internet. And back in 80s, we didn't connect the system to the internet, okay? So now we come to the third generation. The third generation is the back in 90s, okay? And this is what we called it networking. networking. And that's what takes us to what is SCADA, which is what I wanted really to explain to you guys now, because the word SCADA is different than the DCS. When we talked about DCS uh, five minutes ago, we talked that within my uh, factory, I have multiple BLCs or multiple small computers that control the process, and I will connect it to a master server. And this master server is within my facility, within my factory, okay? And I, from this PLC, I can really look at everything and monitor everything. So this is within, okay. And it was connected using the internet, so, uh, so using the network, so it was a good thing. Okay, then now, what if I have, okay, a facility that exists in the middle of the sea, okay, in the middle of the desert, and I don't have enough people to watch this all the time, or I wanted to watch it from a centralized location that's 1,000 kilometers away, okay? And this is happening especially in the power grid. In the power grid, you have the power grid, coming from the nuclear facility, which is usually thousands of miles away from you, okay? And going back, going to something called substation, and from the substation is going to uh, distribution station and distribution station, taking it all the way to your home. 
So all this station I wanted to monitor, some of these station are really in the middle of the desert. How can I have, I have to send the team all the time to monitor this? No. So they started to say, okay, we can use the internet, the uh, great invention of sharing information to share the data to a main station, thousand miles away, Okay, and we can even control this from a thousand mile away. And that is the main difference between distributed uh, controller system and the SCADA. The SCADA means the master station is not exist in the, in the same, uh, in the same uh, facility. It exists away, okay, maybe thousand and thousand of miles away. Okay, and they are connected using the internet or a satellite communication or wireless communication, you name it, or even telephone lines but they are connected, okay? But uh, this is what opened really the door for attacks because now your facility now, okay, does have some equipment and this equipment read to need to be connected to the internet and sending the data, okay? And the guy over here and maybe Jadda or Riyadh can see the data over here, okay? But both of you connected to the network. Both of you are connected to our links, okay? And these devices, I mentioned, it's outdated, old, okay? Very weak systems, which is not designed also in the early beginning for any security. It's only designed to really look after the process inside your factory or inside your power grid or inside your water facility. Okay, so now we have this connection open the door for an attacks from the internet. Because I said, once you open the door for the internet, it's a great to have the powerful sharing of information, but it's also opening the door. So we moved from a completely isolated system, they called it the air gap system, because it's completely isolated from the internet and from everything, to a model that is relaying on the internet to share information. So the, what I wanted to highlight in this picture, what we mean by SCADA. So the master station architect is closely related to the one in the second series with a primary difference being part that of open system architect, rather than a vendor control hacker in, in, inside your environment, okay? Also, what I wanted to say that, look, the major uh, improvement in the self generation SCADA system comes from the use of WAN. We started to ray on WAN technology. WAN technology means we are gonna use internet protocol IB to communicate with it between the master server, which is the one that controls the systems, and the, the rest of my systems. Now I have my data and everything going to the internet and I have one in another part of the country looking at it and controlling it. But in the same time, your data is online. Means that you need to really ensure data is safe while it's translation, data is really um, um, secure at the rest, and the data also when it's being processed by the SCADA server, it's also gonna be secure in order to, make, to, to really uh, ensure security for this system. So we need to really ensure data security, especially with the third generation, um, uh, with the third generation um, uh, of SCADA. Okay guys, what we leave at right now is even more, uh, I would say more open to the attacks than the one in the third generation. Because what we live in, in on it right now is called Internet of Things or the fourth generation. Now we're connecting our IoT, okay, to the cloud. So our data coming from our factories or from the, our sensors going to the cloud. And then because the cloud and the internet and everyone can access it, you know, you as a, the owner of this factory can go in a dashboard here in the cloud. Can you see the IoT? devices status and everything, and you can check all the equipment and everything and can even control it. But in the same time, it's in the cloud. The cloud is very support. The owner of your cloud is someone you really to need to protect your data from. This is one thing. And the cloud means everyone in the world can see it because it's now it's publicly available, okay? And also in the cloud, you have something called multi-tenancy. That's mean one of your actually, uh, people who is sharing with you uh, the same storage and the same, maybe they will launch attack against you. So we open even the door for more attacks against our IoT. So the fourth generation here, the supervisory control and data acquisition system has mainly been driven by advanced in cloud computing, okay? 
and the continuous growth of the Internet of Things using IoT and cloud computing uh, technology such Web HMI and HTML5. Web HMI means a dashboard that you are seeing to control your equipment. So this is a Web HMI, okay? For generation SCADA, system are able to report the status in real time from a remote site is, 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 is spreaded in a far distance, as well as taking advantage of cloud computing environment to implement much more advanced control algorithm. Okay, so basically uh, it's great when it comes to sharing the information. You get your data real time on the internet, save the new cloud, you can access it thousand miles away or maybe even a country away because it's, you can access it from everywhere. But in the same time, as I mentioned, with a great, uh, with a great huge uh, advantage, we have also opened the door for cyber attack. This is in turn has been many developer and manufacturer take up a security by design approach to SCADA cloud and IoT. So now people are started to say, okay, you know what? We need to implement uh, security by design for all of them, for the cloud, for IoT system, for the master server that access this data. So this is um, the approach or the where we are right now. Okay, guys, so far so good? Yes, so far so good. Okay. So as I mentioned, that's for you, for you guys to understand security of SCADA, you need to understand that one of the major issues with SCADA is not only it's being connected to the internet, it is, it's an old, outdated, unupdated uh, systems, okay? So if you guys look at this here over here, it's saying the long cycle, the long life cycle for system and network is 20 years. That means if you take yourself back in the days on 20 years, so you will go back with a, like a time machine to 2002. What operating system was used in 2002? Windows operating system 2000. Okay, you know how unsecure Windows 2000? Okay, it's, I cannot tell you. But if you go and look at Microsoft website, okay, it's out of service, out of support, okay, and they're not releasing uh, batches or update for this system since maybe 2008. So there is no update. And there is so many vulnerabilities in this system. Now imagine that you have your own facilities or your own, um, I would say, factory, they are running this windows right now. Okay, so you're opening the door for so many, many, many uh, issues. One of the uh, one of the companies that are really laying in Windows 2000 with no service back or no updates is large electrical companies. So imagine you have very vulnerable system, okay? Back in 2000, okay, running in your, uh, in your with no proper protection. There's no even updates. Okay, why? Because they feel like, okay, if we update the system, it means that it needs to really have a, a restart and restart means that our production production will stop and we don't know if we really install the update if this system will come up again up because if it didn't come up again we cannot call myself Microsoft and say please help us because we don't have the support for it so this is the dilemma that these uh, ICS systems and SCADA systems they do have okay and again the one issue that was okay as long as the systems is isolated. If you never connect the system to the internet, okay, you need really to look at the internal your network and make sure no one access the system physically and you make sure no one will enter a USB with a malware inside this network because it's gonna cause, cause, cause a lot of chaos. So you really need to look at the physical security. But what make it worse here is you started to connect the system to the internet or you connect it to WAN, or maybe you didn't even connect it to WAN. I wanted to show you a picture of how the system is connected uh, in one uh, single diagram. So you guys can also have um, a quiet understanding of how the system is. So I will show you one diagram, which is very common guys uh, here. It's called would you, would you, uh, ICS SCADA model. Okay, so guys, if you can see this uh, diagram over here, I know it's not very clear, but I try. I'll try to just highlight it. See here, over here, this is where your devices is. Okay, 
your PLCs, okay, your uh, sensors and everything, and maybe a computer engineering is monitoring here, okay? So in the early beginning, come on. In the early beginning, this one was completely isolated. It's not even networked with anything in the, in the, in the upper layer. So the upper management, in, in order to get any update, they will go guys and and really and really try to get the information from the engineering team. Now, what we have done is we said, okay, you wanted to get the data, you wanted to see the data history, you wanted to see how many uh, products we produce today. So we're gonna connect some of the servers here to your machine here. So they open the door for the connectivity from the uh, this network, which is you used to call it air gapped. Air gap means it was completely isolated, and we connected to our enterprise system. Enterprise system where my manager is sitting, my the IT are sitting, or maybe the CFO, the guy who looks for financial settings, the sales team are sitting because they wanted to know what how many products we sold this week and all the stuff. Okay, but these guys also are really connected to what? to the internet, right? So we have these guys in the enterprise level, like the individual are sitting there, okay? Connected to the internet. And if someone compromises their machine and because they are also connected to this system, so their computer now becomes like the gateway for opening the door for connection in our BLC system. So you understand the whole dilemma come from where? I connected these guys to for business needs, for sure, to the enterprise IT or the normal user. And because the normal user are connected to the internet, now I have a gateway or I now I have a way of entry or attack vector to come from outside to inside. And most of the attacks that I've seen in happening, happening in DCS or happening in the SCADA system, someone will compromise an IT system within the, maybe some of the users and use this IT system to reach the SCADA. And then from there, they start to attack the SCADA and cause a lot of trouble. Okay, guys, this is makes sense right now. Okay, yes. so we understand what opened the door for the devil to get in. Yeah, we, we do. Okay, now we under, also, I, uh, just before I leave you guys uh, to go, because this is what is, it's, this is a whole idea behind uh, today is uh, basically uh, is, is, is really important. Another thing that you need to really understand before I will let you go is who's after our SCADA system, okay? And that is really important, okay? We are not talking about here a script kiddie, okay? Or maybe hacktivism, no, no, no. This is the threats here, actors, is different because I know if I harm a big company or I know if I harm your water facility, if I know I will harm your maybe Aramco, uh, uh, Aramco uh, oil and gas uh, company, because it's owned by the government, and the government uses this money to launch a project, I can harm the entire country. So yes, exactly. Now it's opened the door for nation states attack in a whole big group of attackers with unlimited resources, with the support of a government of a country, which is maybe you are, in a competition with, or maybe you are in a conflict with, are really after your system. And that's what takes the attacks to a completely different level, okay? Now you are not trying to stop an attack from a script kiddie. Now you are not trying to stop an attack from hacktivism group, which is more organized groups. No, no, you are trying to stop a nation state. And the nation states are really, really, really specialized hackers. Do you know what they are doing? They are gathering data with very intelligent way, and they know how to hit. And once they will hit, it will really big, big, big thing. Okay, and if you have any doubts, or just try it in the web in any in Google. Just write SCADA attacks in the last ten years. Okay, and if you want to be more specific, do search about the attacks that happen in Saudi Arabia. And I wanted to you guys to look at an attack that happened. In 2018, it's called the Triton attacks. Okay. Read about the Triton attacks. Look at how advanced this attacks was. Okay. And if you want to have a discussion about it, 
we can meet a whole lecture, three hours, I promise you, three hours, okay? To talk about this attacks, okay? And you will find it very, very, very interesting. Okay, so um, uh, it's called Petro Robert Triton Attacks. Um, so this is one thing that's, and uh, again, read about who would be uh, possibly can do this attack or carry out this attack, and you will be also really annoyed by this kind of attacks. Okay, uh, what else I wanted to look at vulnerabilities. Okay, this is some of the attacks that's happened in the wild. Uh, one of them that's it's in the top 10, okay, attacks that's happened in the wild was the one that's happened in Aramco in 2000, uh, 2013. Uh, here's also the power outage we talked about uh, really quickly, but every one of these attack, this one over here, was the first attack uh, attack in the in the in the in the entire uh, in the entire uh, realm of SCADA attacks, and it was crazy. Uh, you can really just read about this, and you spend maybe hours reading about it and how it's been done, uh, and it was like a really big scandal between uh, the U.S. at that time and the uh, United uh, Soviet Union. It's crazy. So um, I even in this lecture. I have already added a little bit about it uh, in the next few slides. So if you have time today, inshallah, after we finish this uh, uh, lectures and you finish the meeting, and at night, if you wanted to really find an amusing story, you can really uh, read about the Serbian uh, pipeline explosion and how many people it's killed and how many uh, the damage that's happened. It used to be like a huge damage. Okay, guys. I don't want to keep you more because you have a meeting with Sahar, and I don't want to say that uh, our instructor is a reason behind it. So um, I'll let you guys go for the meeting. Uh, best of the luck, inshallah, in the meeting, and also uh, best of the luck for the weekend. Uh, do something fun, and I will see you guys, inshallah, on Sunday. Have a yeah. great day. You too, Any man. questions Thanks. so far, guys? Any questions? Okay, perfect. Okay, see you guys, inshallah. Have a great day.
Hello, is anyone here? Hi, yes. Hi. Right, um, you guys um, okay? Yes, I'm okay. But uh, Mr. Shadi, I don't know how to go to the um, Ms. Sahar uh, team's uh, meeting. Yeah, she sent you guys email with something called uh, Microsoft yeah, Teams. Yeah, I didn't receive it. I actually ah, okay. received it, but it's not showing, like when I uh, Okay, maybe some I'll of your colleagues hand. can help. Okay, so you guys all cannot really see it? I, know, I don't know because I don't have it right now. Okay, can some I of you guys know. share it? Share the link with Maha and Abdul Aziz? Yes, please, guys. Uh, I'll send you a link, Okay, sure. 